So ladies and gentlemen, my name is Travis Van Winkle and I am a service junkie. That's right, I'm addicted to helping others. And in no way does that make me a saint, although my beard is quite saintly. <laughs> I am in fact far from it. I want to share with you today my journey into service and how initially uh, I avoided it like it was the bubonic plague and how it began as something that was healing me and then it became something that was driving me and now it's something that sustains me. First, let me take you back to 15 years ago when I was just a punk teenager with very little experience in giving back. Yeah, that was me. I was 19 years old, attending the University of West Georgia. Ever since I was eight years old, I wanted to be a wide receiver in the NFL, and for 10 years, my life was everything football. But as soon as I got to West Georgia to play my freshman year, I quickly realized I was mediocre after puberty at sports, and I was never going to be talented enough, fast enough, or strong enough to make it to the big leagues, so I quit, and I decided to just be a college kid. So my main focus then became drinking and partying and girls and drugs. And I don't know if that was for the girls, the drugs, the drinking, or the partying. That's how I felt as well. And so I focused on those things. You know, I was about hanging out, playing video games. I was big into that, the, the spray can of cheese. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Sometimes I would go to class. And you know, I grew up pretty middle class, but a lot of my friends grew up pretty wealthy. So I was the kind of guy that would always borrow their really nice shirts, and I'd end up ruining them in some way, and then I wouldn't buy them a new shirt, because I'm like, hey, your, your parents can just buy you a new shirt. Or I was the kind of guy that would get drunk and knock off the side mirrors off of cars. Or I was the kind of guy that would get in a wrestling match in your apartment, put a hole in your wall, and not offer to fix it, because hey, it's not my apartment. Yeah, that was me. I was selfish, reckless, and entitled. And look, we all have our things. We all have moments that we regret. Service was not even in the realm of possibility for me at that time, unless I was forced to by law, which happened because I got arrested a few times in college. <laughs> all I cared about was indulging it in what was good for me and only me. After about three years of college, I decided to drop out and move to Los Angeles to pursue acting. And man, I fell in love with it. I was doing all this soul searching. And I was all about personal growth. And I was studying psychology and familial dynamics and, and behavior and emotion. Everything that I could do to ensure that I'd become a working actor. And although I quickly found some success professionally, spiritually, I felt like I was running on empty. To quote author Jen Sincero, it was like I was driving with one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake. I was always often, maybe you guys can relate to this, but I would feel depressed or anxious or less than or worthless, often hopeless. And I was riddled with self-doubt and low self-esteem. I still am. <laughs> so I decided to investigate different modes of spirituality that I was attracted to. Christianity, um, atheism. Buddhism, Vedantic philosophy, Hinduism, yoga. Hell, I even started taking therapy. <laughs> I was on a quest to get to know myself for the first time and I was spiritually thirsty for knowledge and love because I didn't know how to provide that for myself. So around the same time, I decided to, to remove drinking and drugs from my life just to see what it was like without it. Stop numbing myself you know, uh, with, with this, this social lubricant. And around the same time, coincidentally, or perfectly divinely timed, I asked my best friend Justin about the Baha'i faith he always spoke about. And he would always talk about this guy, Bajula, -Baj um, Baba Bagaula. I mean, it could have been Baba Ganoush for all I knew. <laughs> and upon investigation, I realized his name was Bahaula, and he is all that in a bag of chips. Or, as the kids today now are saying, he is lit. <laughs> I think that's what the cool kids say. <laughs> that's ridiculous. Um, so, so this marked the direction in my life that I'm forever grateful for. 
I was introduced to a spiritual community that they focused on embracing all cultures, all religions. We were encouraged to investigate our own truth, to create unity, to join science and religion, to live service. And this was said to be the foundation of true transformation. So all these amazing people were asking me to be of service, whether it was uh, handing out food and clothes to the homeless or performing at hospitals for kids or beach cleanup, et cetera, et cetera. My response was always, hell no. Uh, I got myself to worry about. I'm still feeling a little depressed and anxious. I got my career, like why would I want to focus on, on somebody else? And luckily, they were persistent and they continued to ask. And eventually I would say yes and I would show up. And it turns out that experience would be the highlight of my week. It would be the most alive that I would feel. And it was like that inner misery that I'd felt would be momentarily lifted. And it's not because I felt noble or better then. I finally felt connected. I saw pieces of myself in so many of the people I came in contact with. And the real surprise was this overwhelming amount of empathy that I experienced. Realizing that we are more alike than we are different. And it touched this place in me that all my previous journeys were unable to accomplish. So it was like that, that light bulb moment, you know, that aha moment. I was like, wow, the more I add value to others' lives, the more I add value to my own life. And actually, science backs up this idea that something pretty special happens to us when we engage in acts of good. According to research at Emory University, when you are kind to another person, your brain's pleasure and reward centers light up as if you were the recipient of the good deed, not the giver. And psychologists that study generosity, they have coined this term, helpers high. Helping others also is said to reduce your stress levels, lower your levels of depression, reduce your heart rate, reduce your blood pressure. It can elongate your life. This could be you. Or me. Well, I guess it couldn't, it couldn't really be me. Well, it could be me. Who knows what my life has in store for me? <laughs> but I'm one resistant man, and I just, I could not wrap my head around making service a part of my every week. I would literally tell myself, just shut up and show up, Travis. Just shut up and show up, Travis. Like, I was a crazy person. And, and so... <laughs> the more that I would say yes, the more I slowly began to understand that if I could provide a healing opportunity for somebody else, that was me providing a healing opportunity for myself. Shoshogi Effendi, he tells us, the more that we search for ourselves, the less likely we are to find ourselves. But the more that we search for God and to serve our fellow man, the more profoundly we will become acquainted with ourselves and the more inwardly assured. This is one of the great spiritual laws of life. Thank you, I, I, didn't, I didn't come up with that myself, but thank you. And so I started to, so this, this is an amazing quote, an amazing way of life. And I started, like I was, it's like I'm experiencing that through my actions. I'm a believer. Side note, I'm also a believer. Like, I don't know what it is about this guy. I tell myself that I am not going to like his albums, but I go and I listen to them and I like them. Like, it's crazy. But that's not what this talk is about. The more that I would say yes to service, the more I felt like I was contributing to making this planet better. I started to believe that I could make a real difference with my time here on Earth. And so as my service life, you know, it was amping up, I felt like I had a real funk in my career. I could not book a job to save my life. They could have been looking for a guy with blonde hair, green eyes, all American. They could have, the character's name could have been Travis Van Winkle and I still would not have been right for the part. <laughs> like it was bad. Luckily, I had an acting teacher suggest that I stop focusing on my lack and I join the Big Brother and Big Sister program of LA. Because there are so many underserved youth that are waiting and needing a positive role model. So I said yes, and I got paired with this amazing little guy named Lyric. And this was the first day that we met. I don't know what... I looked, I looked really cool in that photo. 
So most of the kids in the program, they come from broken homes. One or both of their parents are incarcerated. They often live below the poverty line. And so I said yes, even though I wasn't feeling completely whole myself. And to my surprise, I'm supposed to be helping him? No. He's helping me. He's holding me accountable for my actions. I'm wanting to become a better man for him so that he can actually have a positive role model, a positive male in his life. And so I began to learn how to honor and praise him. And I was learning how to honor and praise myself. It was like uh, in Super Mario Brothers. You know, you have the mushroom and you get the one up, it's like <laughs> Like that's, that's what we both felt like we were doing for each other. And so service became this thing that was driving me. It was really driving me. And then I became the one that was creating service opportunities for others. Baha'u'llah says that, you know, we should be a part of this ever advancing civilization. And I felt like I was. And now I'm a big believer that what we focus on finds its way to us. And the more I started to focus on service, the more opportunities came my way. And I got asked to go build a school in Malawi, Africa with an organization called Build On. And they partner with communities in some of the poorest countries in the world. They build schools. And so I got to live. Thank you. I didn't come up with that, but I, um, I'm part of it. So thank you. I got to live side by side with the same people that I would see in National Geographic magazines as a kid. It was an experience that, that changed my life. It expanded my worldview. It removed some of the prejudice that was still dormant in my heart. And it unlocked this joy inside of me that only this experience could. I mean, these people seemingly had nothing, often making less than a US dollar a day. Yet they were teaching me so much about family values and culture. They were rich in all of the areas that I respected and admired. They seemed happy, unriddled with this quest to conquer, without the grips of social media without this competition to be better than, all the stuff that I'm confronted with on a daily basis. And if they don't work together as a community, they will not survive. It was a profound lesson, very profound lesson. So I got back from Malawi, and I ended up getting a TV series. I was a series regular on a show for the first time. It took me 10 years to finally get it, and I got it. So my life is good, I'm working. I'm helping the world. Some real kumbaya stuff is going on. So I should be happy, yet I still feel this emptiness inside of me. Like, come on! I'm doing everything that I should be doing to be happy. I mean, what the F, Jackie Chan? I googled what the F and this is what came up. True story. <laughs> Abdul Baha tells us, be not the slave of your moods, but their master. But if you are so angry, depressed, and sore that you cannot find deliverance and peace even in prayer, quickly go and give pleasure to someone lowly or sorrowful, to a guilty or innocent sufferer. Sacrifice yourself, your time, your talent, your rest to another, to one that bears a heavier burden. And your unhappy mood will dissolve into a blessed, contented submission to God. Yes, like I, I, I understand this because clearly I'm always at odds and depressed about something. So I kept seeing these, these, these little smiling faces of the kids in Malawi. And these were some of the poorest people in the world. And maybe, just maybe, this school would break their cycle of poverty. Maybe it would change generations of lives. So I called up Build On and I said, I want to lead treks like the one I just went on. And they said, yes. And so I, did, I worked my butt off to just download their methodology. And I was off to the races. And I started leading youth from around the US to go build schools in deserving communities around the world. So my, thank you. My point, my point in all of this is, is that I found purpose. I found vehicles of service that I responded to in areas of my life that I feel like I didn't fully take advantage of when I was younger. Like, I wish I had a mentor in college to be like, wake up, dummy. <laughs> I didn't fully apply myself in school. Maybe these kids will. So giving back in these areas that, 
that I was drawn to, it was filling in the blind spots in my life that I still had. So there seems to be this paradoxical symbiotic relationship between self-interest and selflessness. And there's no one way to serve, by the way. There's no rule book, there's no age limit, there's no racial divide. Adding value to others' lives, it's a responsibility that we all have. And to paraphrase Muhammad Ali, service is the price that we pay to live. So it's just like your rent or your mortgage. You know, you pay to live in your house or your home. So I believe that giving back, it's a priority that we must make the through line of our lives. If we imbue our everyday actions with the intent to make others happy, we'll be that much richer for it. You can do anything, really. I mean, put water bottles in your car and hand them out to the homeless people at the stoplights or, or help your friend move or, or like be, you know, let your friend call you and vent about their day. Service, it doesn't have to look one certain way. And I understand that life is always going to have its ups and downs and life will, will just clock us across the face every now and then. But I feel like we have to keep finding deeper ways to serve because giving back is a grounding force in my life that will always sustain me. In closing, I want to share this quick anecdote uh, that Build On recently discovered. So along with building schools, they also have after-school programs in most of the U.S.'s major cities where they engage inner-city youth in acts of service. They did this external evaluation and they found that there are two very important moments in the service experience. The first hour, because that gets you going, that gets you started. And the 25th hour, that galvanizes your commitment to serve. Now, I'm well aware that this does not just apply to inner city high school kids. It applies to me and everyone here today that has yet to find the value of service in their lives. So I'm asking you, do that first hour. And don't just stop there. Get to 25 hours. Get to 100 hours. Get to the point where you stop counting and you just continually make service a priority in your life. And I promise you, it will begin to heal you, drive you, and sustain you. Now, my name is Travis Van Winkle, and I have never been more proud to call myself a service junkie. And yes, I need to help others to be happy. And I'm telling you, regardless of how you get into it, if you make service a focus in your life, you'll be happier for it, and you'll be hooked. Thank you. <laughs>